William Carey was a British Christian missionary, often referred to as the father of modern missions. One of the most inspiring stories associated with him is the Hold the Rope incident. In the late 18th century, Carey was part of a group of missionaries preparing to go to India. As they were discussing their plans and the challenges that they would face, Carey passionately spoke about the importance of their mission and the need to reach the unreached people with the message of Christ. During the conversation, Carey used the metaphor of a well to describe their efforts. He explained that some would go down into the well, representing those who were called to be on the front lines of missions work. However, he emphasized the vital role of those who would stay above, supporting the mission through prayer, financial assistance, and encouragement. Kerry looked at his colleagues and said, I will go down if you will hold the rope. In 1973, mom and dad went down to Republic of Panama as missionaries, and they took along uh, myself and my three older brothers, the four of us, Terry, Tim, Tom, and Ted. Can you all say that? Uh, good job, man. Can you say it in Spanish? Terry, Timoteo, Tomasito, y Tedito. That's what we are. And when we went there in 73, the, just a couple years before, the first Assemblies of God Church had been planted. Catedral de Vida, the Cathedral of Life in the capital city, Panama City. And it was there in that church, the first church, along with a little Bible school in the back rooms of that church, that they started to send out church planters and missionaries. Until today, there are over a thousand churches in Panama. And it, and it began with some missionaries who went there, and then some Panamanians and, and the indigenous principle of the Assemblies of God missions, which is that each country, it is the people of that country, the nationals who will lead, and that we who go as missionaries are to be supportive. But they had the heart of Christ. The Holy Spirit told them, you need to send out workers. It's not to build up your church, Cathedral of Life, to become this big church. It's to send them out. And they did by the hundreds and the hundreds. And mom and dad working in Bible schools. And dad, the national director of, the, of Bible schools, until he handed it over to a Panamanian, that those, those people and the young people and old and men and women, they went to Bible college and Bible school and they prepared to go as planters, and they just planted by the hundreds upon hundreds all across the nation, and then missionaries that were sent out, both in Panama and then around the world. We were a part of that. I got to see that with my eyes. There's a little, literal, a third grader when I went from Dominican Republic to Panama, and I watched this transpire in front of my eyes. And then it just made me think, because here, 55 years later, there is this church called Light 360. And I think somehow I'm seeing Panama being repeated. That can the Holy Spirit actually call a church like Catedral de Vida in Panama and have them start to just send out workers? I mean, churches, how many of you know churches, you're supposed to keep who you have, right? You're trying to get people to come. You're not supposed to be sending them out. And yet the kingdom of God keeps just turning upside down every concept that man and, and, and humans would naturally, logically think is the case. No, we are to send out. And so we say it for Life 360, we're a sending church, planting and believing. Everyone, missionaries, every one of your districts, someday we want to have a Life360 church there. And so help me, they better support you as a missionary. So you let me know if they don't when that time comes. But we're believing it for this, that not just 55 years ago, Catedral de Vida, but here it is for us, Life360 church. And we can look back 2,000 years ago to see how this model is given to us in the Bible. So it's why our first core value is a passion for missions. We believe that that same faith that was in the Bible, that same zeal that we saw in Panama can be ours, church, and that we can see the Lord use us in that way. That's why we have these amazing candidate missionaries, our heroes here, to 
coming every time. And Brother Malcolm says, yes, every time I ask. Can't believe it. He, he always trusts us. Thank you. Because it's such a busy week. They're here for all sorts of training. They are nonstop. All the work that they do. And yet they carve out this time that we can be with them and, and to be able to see them. I want them to come every time because they rub off on you. And, they, and, and you're able to see them. And perhaps it helps nurture that fire, that flame for missions in us as a church. I want to see that happen. And so why we have in our brochures, and each of you received it, that there's a list of our 250 missionaries there, across there, and all of them. That's, and there's a little white box next to it that you can use this as a tool. And every day, check off another name and pray for that name. Pray in, the, in tongues. Pray in the Spirit over them in ways that you don't know what they're going through. But boy, the Holy Spirit does and, and will intercede on their behalf. And then on the inside, there's these 50 new missionaries that we want to support. And I'm, I'm praying that the Lord puts this again in our hearts, that we would be able to see. I've had them say their home district because you recognize some of those names are from these districts, these states that we're believing God to help us to support. So I want you right now, stand with me, have your Bibles. Look at that. 100% of us have our Bibles. I love that. It might be your phone even. But as, I, as we always do, we encourage you, bring your paper Bible, have a highlighter. Today, we're going to ask God to just, from his word, burn into our hearts what the word says in Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, we're going to be looking. And God to help us see that the same pattern we saw in Panama is the same pattern we're seeing here. And it comes all the way back from the heart of Christ by the Holy Spirit. So hold that Bible in the air. We're going to say it together. This is truth. This is life. This is God's word. Lord, we claim it with our hands raised with our Bible. God, our hearts are open. Please let it not be this is a social club and we say little positive sayings to one another. God, no, it is your word. It's sharp and active and living and it, and it cuts us. But boy, does it prepare us for everything you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have those Bibles open. We're looking at the first church ever to send missionaries and it's in Acts chapter 13. So please have that ready. And 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit just started to, to blow on that, those embers and, and the fire of the, of the zeal for the kingdom of God. And it's that same fire that's burning all the way through Panama and here to Springfield and then through our church around the U.S., and the world. So we're going to read it together, New Living Translation. I'll read out loud. You follow along in your Bibles, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manon, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. This is the word of God. We're going to be looking at these three verses. And in the course of this, you're going to be hearing from some of our candidate missionaries also. Five points that come from this coupled with five missionary couples. Number one, the Holy Spirit seeks out those who seek him. Hear me. If we will seek the Holy Spirit, if we will seek after Christ, as we will diligently pray and without understanding how in the natural to do it, if we will yearn for Christ and seek the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will seek after us. We see that here in this first verse. We see that there's this group, it says, among the prophets and teachers. So there's this whole group there in Antioch. But then the, the Holy Spirit thought wise to list in the Bible five men who were leaders in that church. And the, the names are right there, Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius, Manon, and Saul. And God used them as they were seeking after God. The Holy Spirit then sought after them. We see that in verse 2, that it was that says that one day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting. 
So here it is, this church here, they're into prayer. Can you see that? Can you, they're into fasting. They're into worshiping. They're seeking after the Lord. And because of that, the Holy Spirit responded. Wow. How many of you would like to hear from God? How many of you would like to hear from the Holy Spirit? Well, you know what? We need to seek after him. As we do that, then God is a God who says, man, if you'll seek after me, you will find me. I will then seek after you. It comes all the way from the garden when man first sinned and Adam and Eve were hiding and, and God walks through the garden and says, Adam, where are you? He's seeking after us. If we will seek after him. These names, I just love it because it's such a, it's uh, these, uh, you know, Simeon and Lucius and Manon, Barnabas and Saul. They're from all sorts of different places, different ethnic backgrounds put together. And here is this church, Antioch, First Assembly of God, and they're seeking after the Holy Spirit. They're seeking him. And the Holy Spirit responds. There's, there's within them, I could just imagine those five men as they're praying and they're worshiping. There are times when they gather together. They're fasting. They're saying, hey, I'm going to fast this next week. Good, I will too. There, there's a sense of wanting to come together. By the way, that's our church. I see pockets of prayer and formal prayer times and, and Tuesdays and on Sundays and before every service, they're, 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 the prayer leaders are praying and, and there's such a sense of seeking after God. And what happens in, as that happens is that God puts upon us, God gives a sense of the burden for the lost that comes from Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit called me into ministry. Sorry. In the nursery. <laughs> no, not when I was a child. <laughs> no, I was there one Sunday morning volunteering in the church's nursery. There was a child in my arms and the live stream was playing on the screen. The worship service that was happening upstairs was coming through. Some Sundays, Veggie Tales was on the screen and other days we had nothing played on the screen, we just played with the kids, but this Sunday we had the worship service on. And as the last worship song played, there was this like long pause. There was no sound, no activity that seemed to be happening. It was a somber pause and the woman that was serving with me and myself, we, we were anticipating maybe a gift to the Holy Spirit. And so we leaned in wanting to hear and, and anticipating to hear the person in the congregation, but they weren't miked. And so our hearts sank and, and we thought we missed this message. But our pastor, he chose to repeat that message through his mic and he said, someone here is going through a time of transition. It is no little thing. Maybe a career change of some sort. The Lord says to you, do not have fear. The Lord is with you. Seek wise counsel someone of the faith, have hope. And sometime throughout this week, take time to slow down. The Holy Spirit in his omnipresence was extending not just the words of that message through the screen, through the TV to me, but his guidance and his peace and his reassurance. Mm. There, a woman that was sitting next to me in her rocking chair, she looked at me and she said, I think that was for you. <laughs> it was, I knew. And so after like months of praying and fasting about life after college, after wrestling and discerning and desiring to know like God's call and his clarity for my life, he had gotten through to me that day. The Holy Spirit, speaks. And he had called me that day and confirmed that calling to follow him to the mission field, to walk alongside the broken college student, to serve and to love those that are searching for their purpose, for truth, just as I had done only a few years before. 
the Holy Spirit speaks. Amen. Some of you, this is your story. You need to be listening. The Holy Spirit is nudging you. The Holy Spirit seeks after those who are seeking Him. Number two, the Holy Spirit does amazing things when we pursue the Lord. When we see this passage here in Antioch, in Acts chapter uh, 13, and we see in verse Two, that it says, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul to the special work to which I have called them. Here's the Holy Spirit. You, you, the Holy Spirit dreams up for us things before we're even born. God has already dreamed wonderful things for your life. I pray for my granddaughters, as I prayed for my sons, and I tell them all the time, and I've said it to every one of you that has kids. I will say it when I call for your, the birthday of your kid, uh, or uh, when I talk with them in person, I say that God has a wonderful plan for your life. God has a wonderful plan. If we will only seek Him, then the Holy Spirit does amazing things. Here it is. The Holy Spirit's dreamed it up. They were praying. God was waiting for a church that would do that. Antioch Maybe wouldn't have been the name that we would read in the Bible. It might have been another church. But Antioch, there was a group that was seeking after the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does amazing things. He says, here it is. I'm ready to call them the first missionaries to be able to go. The Holy Spirit's already dreamed it. And what happens for us is that we come to this point in our lives when, when we, uh, are, the Holy Spirit's calling us. And we're thinking, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that couldn't be me. Maybe it's not what God has called me to do. Or maybe we'll say, I just feel it in my heart. I haven't done enough yet because the Holy Spirit is calling. The Holy Spirit does amazing things when we pursue him. We wanted to share a little bit about how that has played out in our lives. And so as we, as we, As we lived our lives, we, we understood that, that what the Holy Spirit has done, we sought after him, and he took us through a process. And that process was not one that was just an immediate click in our lives, but he took us step by step through the, through the process. So as the Holy Spirit guided us, we had to go through a series of decisions where we had to give him our, our yes every single time. And so... We both had the call to foster care at a very early age, before we could even think about what that even meant. It wasn't until years later that we were both working corporate jobs, we started the training process to become foster parents. Fast forward to today, we've been parents to 34 children. Wow. He then called us to vocational ministry where I've served as executive pastor of our, of our local church, and Jen has been in women's ministry. But we also knew that the Lord has called us to more, that we felt like we weren't doing enough. So he prompted us again. And so he's called us to what we're going to be doing as uh, chaplains to foster care. The amazing thing is, is that when the Spirit leads us, he always leads us closer to him and he's always calling us to lead others closer to him. And as foster parents, we've really been able to see God working out his redemption story in people's lives. For example, about three years ago, we got a call for a baby and we nicknamed him Mavi. And his parents were both in jail and battling addiction. And when Mavi arrived, he was an absolutely adorable baby. He looked like the boss baby. We wanted to put him in a little suit because it was, it was uncanny. It was amazing. But his, his case didn't really look like there was much hope for reunification. But we serve a God who's in the redemption business, right? So Mavi's dad, he found Jesus in jail. And when both his parents were released, they committed themselves to sober lives and to building healthy, a healthy home for their family. And we were able to support them and help them create a safety plan 
and help them gain tools to parent their children. And before Mavi was one years old, he was reunited with his parents. Since then, they have welcomed another baby, and they are thriving. They are thriving because they were given the chance to face their addictions, build a support system, and ha gain valuable life skills while we walked beside them and cared for Mavi. Our heart is that believers will begin to see that foster care and their involvement in it is the fulfillment of James 127. And we as a church have the opportunity to play a part in God's redemption story and show God's grace and love to the people in foster care and to kids in foster care with one spirit-led yes at a time. Yeah. Number three, the Holy Spirit appoints some to be sent others to be senders. Look in verse 3 here, because this truth we are living out here at Light360. So after some more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. At the end of the service, all of our candid missionaries are going to come up, and we're going to lay hands on them, okay? Now, some of you from the hood, you're thinking, no, we're not, talking about, we're not going to beat them up. Man, we're going to pray an anointing upon them, and we're going to believe it. And then, by the way, they're going to turn around, they're going to lay hands on us. It's going to be awesome. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. Some are sent, others are senders. If you recall, there are how many listed by name in verse 1 of, you can see it right in front of you, Acts 13. How many? Fair. There were five. How many went? Two. How many stayed and sent them? Three. So there is within God's plan, there are those that are sent and there are those that are sending them. That's why, church, we talk about this all the time as a church, and we encourage you, please give your for, to missions. Robin and I, we live it out. We give to missions. It, it burns within us. It burns within each of us. So who gets the credit, by the way, in the Bible in Acts chapter 13? You kind of, you're all afraid to say, oh, the Holy Spirit, sure, the Holy Spirit. We do know the names Saul becomes Paul and Barnabas, don't we? How many of you could name the other three just from memory? Oh, we've looked at it right now, but the fact is we probably wouldn't remember those names. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit remembers those names. The Holy Spirit had heard them praying before, and they continued to pray afterwards. They were the support. They were the ones that were saying, you know what, Holy Spirit, you've called Saul, you've called Barnabas, we're going to send them out. And we're going to hold the rope for them. I thank God that there are Simeons and Manons and Luciuses in this church. You don't care about getting name recognition. God in heaven knows your name. God already dreamed it up and planned it for us. And we say, you know, we're going to hold the rope for Saul and for Barnabas. And through the centuries now comes to us. And we say, we're going to hold the rope for these 50 missionaries. Because just like that church in Antioch, we're the senders. And then there are those that are the ones who are sent. God help us to hold the ropes. Because you know what? As we believe this, and the Holy Spirit is appointing some that he's sending, and we're then sending them out by our support in prayer and in, and in financial support, then God says, comes along, and he says, you know what? I'm going to confirm what I'm doing in their lives. I'm going to confirm it through your prayers. I'm going to confirm it. People are going to meet the Lord. I came to know the Lord when I was in college through Chi Alpha, and I graduated, started working pretty quickly after that at Hobby Lobby in their management training program. And through that time, I got to share all the rich memories and fond times I had with the Lord, with brothers and sisters in Christ in college. And I quickly learned that, that my story was not everyone else's story, that the employees around me, they would share about the choices they made in college, and they weren't, let's just say, the best choices. And then they had to live out those choices in their lives. And they talked about it like it was such a miserable time in their lives. And my heart, it really hurt hearing the stories, but then it broke even more when I saw them still living out those choices. And something inside of me, it screamed that, that that's not right. And that wasn't what the Lord desired for their lives. And how is it that I had such a rich time with the Lord 
but they didn't. And I realized now that that was the Holy Spirit uh, bearing witness to, to my spirit to saying, they didn't have to be. And the story of their lives, it, it could have been different if they would have had someone to reach out to them, if they would have had someone standing in the gap. And that's when I sent the Lord, say yes, for us, for me to get sent back to the university campus through Chi Alpha, through college ministry and make an impact uh, in their lives. I remember being a young girl who grew up in church and um, loved Jesus and it, I was at a, I was, when I was in fourth grade, I was at an AG kids camp, and I was down at the altar seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was in that moment I sensed just that still small voice of God speak to my heart and say, one day you're going to preach and teach and share Jesus with others. So fast forward to a few years ago, we were on campus, and we met a young freshman girl, her name was Simone, and she had you know, played around with the new age movement things and really didn't think there was even a God. And we just so happened to meet her and we became her friend. We started talking about Jesus and just the way that we would share Jesus and the joy that we had, it made her curious. So one night she was in her room and she decided to cry out, God, if you are really the creator of the universe, would you reveal that to me right now? And guess what? The Holy Spirit met her, and she gave her life to Jesus. She started leading her own small group of students, and she started seeing them come to know God. And it was during that time that she also, she sensed that still small voice of God that spoke to me so many years ago, it was now speaking to her too, and calling her to go proclaim God's word overseas. And so now today, this month actually, it's been one year of her being over in East Africa, now sharing Jesus with women who are Muslim. Wow. Wow. So look at your brochures here. And open it up, would you please? And look here for the goal of our mission summit, these seven states, seven districts, and these faces of these people. God help us, if, if they're gonna be the ones that are sent by the Holy Spirit, then there are the Luciuses and Simeons and Manons who stay behind and are sending them. Could we as a church be ones to send these 50. Paul McDonald, the superintendent of Southern Missouri, he mentioned thank you for the three that you see on there for, excuse me, for Northern Missouri. And you can see that on your map down here. There's three of them because we're already supporting the other 12. We already have them on support. They have a good missionary troop. There's three more that are waiting for that. But if you go up to the top here, to Northern New England, do you see that? The Northern New England district? And you see there's a whole group of them there. And they're from this area here, Maine, Vermont. Uh, don't know what the other ones are called up there, <laughs> my geography. But uh, who was it? what was it? New Hampshire, there you go, of course. And uh, look at those faces. Those are awesome, this group here. By the way, uh, Dolan and Molly, stand up. Where are you? Dolan and Molly. They're from the northern New England. You heard them up here. Here they are. If the Lord confirms in our church next Sunday is Faith Promise Sunday, we're going to be taking you on. Here's the fruit of being able to follow through on a brochure like this. One more hand to Dolan and Molly. Awesome. And also in your hands or you have right there, you got this here, this uh, missions giving card. And again, next Sunday, this is what we're wanting for as many as possible, I pray to God, it would be all of you. Every year I talk with Brian. I say, Brian, how much do you want to give? And, and, we, and, we, and we process. It's not a large amount, but it's for Brian to have the sense. He is a sender also. We are all senders. God help us as we look at that and we would say, okay, I think that I could increase by $10 a month. I think I could increase by whatever the, whatever the Lord would say on your heart. Am I, am I pushing you on this? Absolutely. I believe it. It burns on my heart. Five seconds into eternity, we'll wish we had given all of our money away to those missionaries so they could go to East Africa or they could go to Texas or they could go around the world and tell others because we're the ones. Now, next Sunday when we do this, it'll be a process. Please, don't, there, I, as much as I say that I'm pushing you, the Lord's the one who will put it on your heart. Okay, you just follow what the Lord says. That's next Sunday we'll be doing this. And the offering in its entirety is going to go to 
missions and we're going to just see such a wonderful thing. You'll want to have that, put that in your hand, and let's believe the Lord to do something special through us next Sunday, okay? Number four, the Holy Spirit imparts all that we need to be all that God desires us to be. When the Holy Spirit calls, then he provides everything that we need. Acts chapter 13, verse four, it continues and says, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Here it is. The church sends them, but it's the Holy Spirit that's sending them out. And we see, for the rest of the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit is providing everything that they need. He imparts all that Barnabas and Saul need. And it's interesting, if you hold your Bibles there, and if you'll take a look here, the Holy Spirit, he's providing, the, at each step of the way, he's providing exactly what is needed. So let's follow along just a little bit in Acts chapter 13. Check this out. With your highlighters, by the way, the verses that we've already mentioned, be sure that you've highlighted that. But here's it. So they're sent out. They don't have a missions organization. There's not an Assemblies of God uh, t- team. There's not U.S. missions admin with all the stuff they provide. They're just, they're going out and they're figuring it out. And as much as we say that it was by faith, let me tell you, it is by faith what our missionaries do today, even with the amazing support. It's always by faith. So by faith, they go down to the seaport and then they go to this island called Cyprus. We, we know that. You've heard of that. They go to a town called Salamis, and they preach the word starting there, and they go from town to town. You look there in Acts 13, it's doing that. They go across the entire island until finally they meet, they, they go to Paphos. And in Paphos, there is a, a demon possessed woman by the name of, uh, or excuse me, a demon possessed person by the name of uh, uh, Bar Jesus. Interesting, son of Jesus. Is also called by Elimus, which is actually Greek for sorcerer. But this person then starts to, uh, this woman starts to harass Paul and Barnabas. And she's attached to the governor. The governor of the island wants to hear the gospel. And so this woman starts to harass and start to interfere with what God is trying to do through Barnabas and Saul, and she's urging the governor, pay no attention to what they're saying. Then you come to verse 9 in your Bibles, and you see what happens here, that Saul, called Paul, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. You see that? You should highlight that in that verse there. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looks Elimus right in the eye, and he says these words. He says, you son of a devil. I'd love to use that term, by the way, but I won't use that on you. You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud and enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. And in that moment, God strikes Elimus, blind and mist in darkness, it says, comes over the the man's eyes and and he begins groping around, begging for someone to help him. And the governor, of course, sees this happen. The governor receives the word of the Lord. It's missionary work that's laid out right there in our Bible. It's what we are following today, that somehow God needs to give us a vision. Somehow God needs to show us that there's a world out there that needs one. That in America, there are those that are lost. We need to water the fruit of that garden, which is the Holy Spirit's prompting in our hearts. I remember the moment the Holy Spirit called me to go. It was an early morning before the sunrise. I would spend my mornings quietly in the garden. As I was watering my rose gardens, This particular morning, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I have other gardens for you to water. Roses are but for a season. I was sent sometime later to the Garden City in Southeast Asia. I lived a lot of life before coming to faith. I came to faith later in life. And I know that if the Holy Spirit can rescue and save me, he can do you also. It was in 2001 that the Holy Spirit rescued me when I came to the saving knowledge. And after a loss of desire to live with no hope, he found me. 
The Holy Spirit continued to, per to pursue me, and in 2007, he sent me on a short-term missions trip. It changed my life. I knew I was called. I knew I was called to be there, and I didn't want to leave. I felt the Holy Spirit call again in 2009 for a trip to Nepal. Yet it was in 2010 that the Holy Spirit separated me from corporate America to follow him into full-time missions. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit, I surrendered to his plan, whatever it looked like. I surrendered and said, Hineni, here I am, send me. And recently I was called down again from Southeast Asia to the lost souls of America through the LGBTQ. That you also may open up your hands and say, Hineni, here I am, Lord, send me like a well-watered garden. Uh -huh. The truth of the scripture tells us this, when we have the Holy Spirit, we have all that's needed to be all that God desires us to be. Number five, final point, the Holy Spirit uses such a church as Antioch to change the world. We read about it, it's in the Bible. Here is this church that loved and cared and sought after the Holy Spirit and God sends the first missionaries out. We are the recipients of these missionaries and their work, my friends. We are products of that wonderful work, the garden that they had been watering. And so we see it here. In fact, if you're looking at Acts chapter 14 in verses 26 and 27, after they go out on their missionary work, missionaries, they always come back and report to the churches, don't they? Take a look at this. Finally, they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. So I just highlighted those areas here, man. The believers, they had entrusted. That's the, that church. I'm, that's us here, my friends, that we entrust our missionaries to the grace of God. And then they called the church together. That's us doing this. You wonder why we do a mission summit, a missions convention? It's because the scripture tells us to do that. And the missionaries reported everything God was doing and how the door of opportunity was being opened, whether it's LGBTQ or it's on a campus or it's foster care or any number of these areas, God is opening those doors and the missionaries are coming back and they're reporting to us. And the missionaries, as they, as they do this, they, they wonder, God, I'm sure every one of them feels it because we feel it too. Am I good enough? Am I good enough to do the work? Then I tell you, when God calls, and there's my hand pointing one more time here. <laughs> if I am alive and if God is the God in heaven who seeks after those who seek him, then God says to us, yes, you're good enough. Doing what I'm doing today was absolutely the last thing I thought I'd ever be doing. And let me tell you why. Because I was that dude that went off to college and walked away from Jesus. Walked away from him completely. I got caught up into a lifestyle of partying, drinking, sleeping around. I was a cheater. And I ended up into a, just a really dark place where there's just a lot of shame, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, a lot of resentment. And I, and I was the kind of guy that would sometimes show up to church and something like this, actually, and I would sit in the front row reeking of alcohol after a night of partying. That was the kind of guy that I was. And I got so lost that I was just ready to give up on life. I wanted to, to die and even try taking my life. And then fast forward a few years in college, I'm in the last semester of my senior year, and I'm... I'm hopeless, absolutely hopeless, ready to give up on God because I didn't believe he could use me. I didn't believe he could actually love someone like me. And then when I was leaving the church, some dude just stopped me and he invited me and the Holy Spirit met me in the lobby. And I just broke down and like 
the hardness that was around my heart, just a piece of it chipped off. And that last semester, this was my confession prayer. It was, Jesus, if you're for real, I'm going to be for real. He's never stopped being for real. Hmm. The Holy Spirit started to change my life. He started to heal the wounds in my heart. He started to transform me. He started to remind me of who he was. He started to correct how he viewed me and how I should view myself in his eyes. And then he called me to come back to the very university where I cursed him to preach the gospel and to, and to reach students that were far from him. And I wrestled with him because the thoughts, the thoughts that were in my head, it's like, I'm not good enough. I'm not the one. I can't do this. And then after seven years, and I'm, we're, we're about to go and pioneer at the University of Louisville, and, and I'm still wrestling with that. And, 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 and like, he's like, yeah, you're right, Eric. You're not the one. You're not good enough. Because I'm the one. I'm good enough. And you're only here because of my goodness. And I will use, I will use who I please because it pleases me to do so because it brings me glory. It brings me glory and it draws people back to me. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's your story. That's my story. I'm going to ask all of these missionary candidates, missionaries, would you come up and just stand here in the front here? And what we're going to do in closing is that as, one, as they've come here, and then I'm going to invite us, as many as you will, to come and we're going to lay hands, Acts chapter 13, we're going to lay hands upon them and send them out. We're going to be able to be part of that great tradition and the great uh, running army of God through the centuries and the millennia, and it continues on today that we have this opportunity to pray for them. So as they're coming here, as many as you who would want to, two things. One is to pray for them, but also as you're coming forward, you're saying, God, whatever you want from me, God, you do it in me. So stand up, everybody, and as many as you have the guts to do it, and you're brave, you come up and you pray for these missionaries, and here's what we'll do. I will be interrupting us with instructions for this, and this is going to be our closing time of prayer. But here they come, and here's what we're going to do here right now. In fact, look up at me, everybody, and look up here on the screen. Let me show you what this says here. Acts chapter 29. Acts chapter 29 is not in the Bible. It ends with Acts 28. But Acts 29 is what we're living out now. And here's the very words from Acts 13, only it's for us today. This day as we are worshiping the Lord, the Holy Spirit is saying, I've called you. I have appointed you. Now do my work. Let's lay hands upon them. Let's tell this right now. Everybody who's out there, you stretch your hands out toward them all. So, Lord Jesus, we claim it right now for every one of these candidate missionaries that you, Lord Jesus, have said to these missionaries, I've called you. I've called you. Before you were born, I already called you. And then the Holy Spirit says, now I've appointed you. I've appointed you for the work you're doing. And so now these missionaries, we say it in, re in response, Lord, now I'm going to do your work. We pray your protection over these missionaries. We pray your anointing upon them. We pray that, God, you will give them support financially, that there will be people that will be senders even as they're sent. And that, God, you will support them, Lord God, through the prayers of your saints, churches like Antioch, churches like Catedral de Vida, churches like Life 360, that, Lord, you will be used. You will use them to send these missionaries, even as you have appointed them. God, we claim it by the laying on of hands, great victory for each one of these missionaries. In Jesus' name, we pray it. Amen and amen. Now listen, look up at me, everybody. I know it's kind of weird to cut you off from praying, but I'm going to do it here. Now look at me. We prayed this prayer over you, missionaries, but we as a church, wow, 
we need you to lay hands upon us. So re representing everyone here, representing Auditorium 2 and those that are online, I want you missionaries now to turn toward these ones. And as many as you can put your hands on, we're going to receive the prayer of these missionaries upon us as a sending church. So we receive it. Church, raise your hands in submission to God. Missionaries, pray over these ones. Make your way out however you want to. And I will pray like a missionary. Jesus, as missionaries, we pray for this church. We lay hands upon those that are close. And the laying on of hands, it's symbolic of the spirit power falling upon them. That God, you sent Paul and Barnabas. But Lord, there was Simeon and Lucius and Manon. That's who we are. We're going to pray. We're going to support financially. We're going to believe you, God, to do mighty things. So do it now in us. Make us the church of Antioch. Make us the church that's sending. Let it be that from us you send new missionaries, teenagers that are in this service. You're going to call to missions. Adults in corporate America, you're going to call into missions. We are going to be a sending church. We claim it through the laying on hands. Holy Spirit, you've already dreamed it up. We say yes and amen to all that you have dreamed. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. And everybody says, amen and amen. Hey, this concludes our service. Love one another. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. God bless you as you go.